Letter 5 I, the Christ, am writing this letter 5 to clearly define the hidden reality, which I also refer to as the universal and divine, to help you stretch your minds to understand that while you are an individual, that which has given you being and individuality is itself universal, eternal, infinite, everywhere without beginning or end. For the sake of those people who have chosen to read Letter 5 before my earlier letters describing my life and true teachings on earth, I will make a further statement that my true Jesus Christ self must not in any way be confused with the Jesus recorded in the New Testament. Since my original teachings in the form of the four Gospels have been distributed worldwide and grossly misinterpreted, it is my intention to begin teaching truth of existence by explaining the true meaning of my original terminology as quoted in the Gospels. This is necessary to dispel and eventually eradicate from people's consciousness the misunderstandings which have persisted and misinformed generations of spiritual seekers since my life on earth. When on earth, to describe the reality behind and within existence, I deliberately coined the term the Father when referring to God. This was done for two reasons. Firstly, as I explained in letter one, when I received enlightenment in the desert, I was enabled to see that the concepts describing the creator of the universe, as revealed by Jewish prophets, were completely wrong. Secondly, I was given to perceive clearly and fully understand the true nature of the Creator, and I realized that it was a nature of parenting, of fulfilling the needs of creation in clear-cut, specific ways which were synonymous with those of a father-mother. Indeed, I saw that the parenting impulses present in all living creatures had been drawn directly from the Creator, and that the origin of all love and parenting drives was also the origin of life and existence itself. I also saw that creation was a visible manifestation of the universal creative impulses of being, and therefore humankind could be termed the offspring of the Creator. For this reason, it was quite natural for me to speak of the Father when referring to the Creator, since to me, this is what the Creator truly is in every way, more especially Father-Mother but having regard to the Jewish insistence on the woman occupying a subordinate position in their daily lives, I referred only to the father to avoid Jewish resistance and to gain their acceptance of the new terminology. I also coined the term the father to help the Jews realize that their concept of Jehovah and the rigidity of Jewish laws were totally erroneous. Also, by using a new terminology, the Father, to describe the Creator, the creative impulse, behind and within existence, I made it clear I had brought an altogether new teaching in opposition to the accepted belief in a God which rejected certain people and sent disasters upon them as retribution. I want you to understand fully that nowhere has it been made clear in your New Testament that I brought a teaching completely opposed to the teachings in the Old Testament, and therefore the New Testament, as a true record of my life and teachings, cannot be trusted or accepted or believed. A true and accurate record of my personality, enlightened nature, emotional attitudes and teachings themselves, would have made it abundantly clear that the old Judaic forms of religion and my enlightened teachers were diametrically opposed in every way. The Judaic religion was one of extreme materialistic concepts. There are certainly writings from which spiritually enlightened Jews drew and continue to draw a mystical perception of our source of being. They are to be greatly honored and respected for their transcendent states of mind. But as the prophets reached the average man and woman, Their writings transmitted a different controlling message, which is purely human and false. No control for good or evil is exercised from God above. If there were, the world would not be in such a shocking state of upheaval and misery. 
I brought a new teaching which was directed exclusively at making people aware of universality and love, the indwelling nature as well as the transcendent nature of that which brought all creation into visible manifestation. It is my purpose to make this abundantly clear to enable seekers of truth to rid themselves of any remnant of belief that I was merely a prophet in a long line of Jewish prophets, that I continued preaching their themes of an almighty Jehovah, possessing ambivalent feelings towards his own creation. Fear of Orthodox Jews kept my disciples in line with what they had decided they would tell the public about me. You must remember that to gain new Jewish adherence to Christianity, they were afraid to discard the Old Testament since it had held the Jews together for centuries. Therefore, they extracted and added on from my teachings whatever was compatible with the old religious beliefs. My genealogy was listed to reassure Jewish people I had descended from King David. Why should they bother with this unless they wanted to make it clear that I was very much a Jew of ancient lineage and therefore could be a candidate for messiahship? If they truly understand what I had come to earth to do, to break away from the past and lay the foundations for an altogether new future of understanding and activity, they would have made valiant efforts to make certain that people understood the true purposes which drove me to the day of my death. But they did not do this. They obscured much of what I tried to teach. A strong-hearted disciple of mine, Stephen, was less afraid to speak out about my true teachings, although these had also been embroidered, but even so, he was stoned to death. You must understand that life for my disciples was precarious, and it is little wonder that my true teachings were covered over with traditional thinking to make it more palatable to the public. Even so will there be fast disputations when I say that Christianity only presents a record of some of my statements and healings which are not in too much conflict with Judaic teaching. It is a religion coined by my early disciples and by Paul after his induction in Antioch to keep the Jews together as far as possible and to bring Gentile converts into the fold. Expediency then became a facet of Christian thought. This is the truth of my life and death on earth. Disputations will arise because people hold on to cherished beliefs and surrender them only with the pain experienced by those who lose their dearest possessions. Nonetheless, dear as the beliefs may be to people, they are only beliefs. They are not a sure foundation on which to build new lives. Now that I am returning to you through the medium of these letters, I am again making every attempt possible within the parameters of your human perceptions, to describe for you the reality, your source of being, which initiated the universe and existence itself. Exactly as two thousand years before, I have now come through the medium of these letters to lay the foundation for future spiritual evolution during the next millennium. Your spiritual development can only arise out of your deeper perceptions and understanding of the nature of existence, and of that which brought you into being. For what you clearly perceive creates the conditions under which you live. Because you have not understood your true spiritual origins, humankind is continually embroiled in wars and has spawned earthly conditions which are both a disgrace to human consciousness and a source of human suffering of every kind. For this reason, I am sending radiating the full power of my Christhood consciousness to bring the truth of existence to you in the kind of modern understandable terminology to enable you to construct a new consciousness and realization of truth as it really is, rather than allow you to continue adhering to those false beliefs you have been taught or have been brought to you by tradition. With usage and understanding, the terminology will come to arouse in you the same or more reverence and love and spiritual insight as you previously felt when using the word God. Loaded with universal meaning, the more appropriate terminology 
will eventually fill you with spiritual power when you use and visualize the meaning of the words. I am here to tell you that when you have purified your consciousness of the gross human thoughts and feelings pertaining to the ego drive, and persevere in meditation and a lifting up of your consciousness to the universal, you will begin to feel the spiritual power invading your mind and eventually your whole body. Therefore, my teachings are exclusively directed at assisting you to open your consciousness to newness of life, vitality, and spiritual power, that you may abandon your old way of limited and dissatisfied living and find a new source of inner joy and fulfillment of your every need. Think about this statement. I have not brought you any shoulds or should nots or frustrating restrictions. You yourselves do not want to impose on yourself. I have certainly come to tell you how your consciousness forms have life within them and eventually manifest in your world, but I leave it to your good sense to choose the healthy thoughts, the loving actions, and the right path leading to joy and fulfillment when you realize the true nature of creation. I have also come with the full force of my Christ power to help you realize that there are no barriers between you and that which brought you into being. Only those that you have created yourselves through ignorance of the laws of existence. I have come to help you remove the barriers by enlightening your present ignorance and teaching you how to open your consciousness, your entire being, to the inflow of that which brought you into being. Therefore, I repeat, in the final analysis, my teachings are exclusively directed at assisting you to open your consciousness to newness of life, vitality, and spiritual power, that you may abandon your old way of limited and dissatisfied living and find a new source of inner joy and fulfillment of your every need. I long for you with divine love to reach this supreme state of being before you pass into the next dimension, that your passing may be painless and your transition one of sublime anticipation. This is the sole motivating purpose behind the letters. The above statement is a more compelling and powerful rephrasing of the statement I made when on earth. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and all good things will be added to you. I did not make this statement to entice people to be good. I stated a fact of existence. You must also understand fully and clearly that that which you call God, and I refer to as universal, possesses none of the human attributes attributed to it by many religions. The human characteristics of anger, threats, and punishment, for instance, only pertain to the human condition. Again, I repeat, I, the Christ, have come down to dictate these letters expressly to disinvest people's minds of the former human word pictures coined by prophets. It is my firm intention to replace them with descriptions of the power, the universal consciousness, which really creates, moves within, and supports the visible universe and all of the dimensions beyond your present perception and comprehension. I am also here to tell you these further universes and dimensions will be opened and will be accessible to your consciousness when the knowledge outlined in these letters is absorbed and made the very fabric of your individualized consciousness. Eventually, death will come to mean a happy transition from a limited dimension of existence to a brighter and more powerful one. You will know that when you are adequately spiritually cleansed and the time is ripe to emerge from the capsule of your body, you will leave, relieved to be free of physical limitations, to enter a dimension of love and beautiful and wondrous beingness. You will perceive death to be what it can be, really is for enlightened souls, a glorious transition, a gift of greater life, greater creativity, and an experience of ecstatic being you have not yet dreamed of. I also want to make it clear that many, many people believe that they can live fruitful and fulfilled lives by following the hundreds of various teachers of positive thinking. Changing your consciousness, they say, will change your lives. This is true to a limited extent. 
but for spiritually evolving seekers, such a change in consciousness still leaves a dryness of spirit and a yearning for something more. That something more that the soul craves is the true contact and reunion with its source of being. While you may have drawn a certain amount of spiritual growth by following the path of perceiving only the good, the truthful and loving, you remain an entity functioning alone in your own earthbound domain, unassisted by the eternal, infinite universal. Once you realize the nature of the universal and turn your thoughts to making true contact with it, you begin to realize you are no longer alone, you are supported by the reality which supports the universe. And when I say making true contact with it, I mean that the prayer of supplication for this benefit or that is not making true contact with your source of being. Your prayer is certainly received into the source of being, and an answer is frequently received swiftly, and the need is fulfilled even as you have asked. But true contact with the source of your being is only experienced when you have sufficiently cleansed your consciousness of the gross human ego drive and have spent some time in meditation and a regular emotionally powerful reaching out in consciousness to your source, seeking contact and renewal and refreshment of spirit. This is the true purpose behind existence, a constant and mutual reciprocation of communication between the source of all being and creation. Here I would remind you that when I lived on earth, I made it abundantly clear every day to the Jews that, of myself alone, I could do nothing. I constantly stated that, it is the Father does the work, not I. I have come at this time to enable you to make the transition from the earthbound human consciousness to that of enlightenment when a person knows that he or she finally knows the truth of being. Undoubtedly, deeply religious people, indelibly indoctrinated with religious dogma and theology, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, or belonging to any other religious persuasion, will find it difficult, even painful at first, to accept and make good use of these letters, for a conditioned and programmed mind is like concrete. Cherished beliefs, used as talismans, emotional supports, and affirmations to give strength in times of crisis, are emotionally imprinted in the subconscious and usually incorporate in them a fear of offending God when contemplating moving on to some higher truth. Unless there is a sincere longing to know the truth of being rather than traditional beliefs, these mental patterns are almost impossible to annihilate in the mind and emotions, and they block true spiritual progress. I have come expressly to help those who have the will to do so move beyond these barriers to true enlightenment. Therefore, if you feel intuitively that the words on these pages are true and you feel drawn to them, have confidence you are ready to begin the spiritual journey outlined in these letters, and I am at hand to give you the courage to pursue it until you reach your goal, true spiritual enlightenment, newness of life, strength of will, and a finding of what I termed the kingdom of heaven. Daily, sincere meditation and prayer will enable a mental cleansing to take place, and gradually, truth and understanding will replace the old myths which once were so dear to you. At the outset of the following teachings, I, the Christ, must remind you that yours is not a solid universe. As you probably know, according to your scientists, solid matter, the visible substance of the world, is really composed of energy particles. The truth of being of your earthly dimension rests on this fundamental reality of creation. To understand my teachings regarding the truth of being, it is necessary to grasp this fundamental, seeming emptiness underlying all your created world. The majority of you know this fact of existence intellectually, but it has not yet even remotely filtered through to your consciousness to give you a new perspective of the world and existence itself. You continue as you have done for millennia, 
thinking that your world is solid and the conditions of the body and all other external phenomena are beyond your control. You believe you are the victim of existence, instead of which the reverse is true. And your daily lives reflect these beliefs. Therefore, it is absolutely necessary for me to return and help you move on to a higher perception of truth. As I said in letter one after enlightenment in the desert, I came back into my world of Palestinian towns and villages and immediately began to control the elements of matter wherever I saw the necessity to help those who were deprived or suffering. I have come to show you exactly why I was able to do this. As I reveal to you in letter one, during the time I received full illumination in the desert, I was shown that matter was not really solid. I was not given to understand exactly how the electrical particles, which I termed the shimmer of motes, took on the appearance of visible matter. I only knew that these motes were moving at high frequencies of speed within God-mind, and God-mind was therefore universal. I perceived that God-mind was both the creator and substance of all things within creation itself. Of this I was absolutely certain. I also saw very clearly that human thought, when fraught with conviction or emotion, radically affected the process of materialization of visible forms. Therefore, the human mind could and did interfere with the true intention of God-mind. It was a thrilling and exalting realization since the myths taught me by the Jewish rabbis were clearly false and were immediately swept out of my mind. I embraced the truth with excitement since I now realize why people experience misery and suffering. This emanated from their own thought processes. I was also given to see the communities of living particles, which science has named cells, at work within every living thing. I was aware of the divine harmony controlling the work of the cells, which were busily building and maintaining the various parts of the physical bodies of all living creatures, and plant life, big and small. This is why I drew heavily on the countryside to give example of the imminence and activity of the Father within the least of wildlife, such as plants and birds. As I have clearly explained in letters 1 through 3, I called God mind the Father because I was enabled to see, perceive, the true nature of the God mind and was determined that when I returned to the people of Palestine to describe the revelations I had received, they would understand that their beliefs imbued in their very consciousness by the rabbis were entirely false. I saw that the true nature of God-mind was the very highest form of divine love, and this could be seen consistently active within every living thing. As I mentioned above, out of this knowledge I was able to perform miracles and control the elements where appropriate and necessary. Just as I longed to explode the myths which possess the minds of the Jews in Palestine, so do I yearn to show you that many of the theories put forward by your scientists have been prompted by a strong reaction to the church dogma and doctrines in years gone by. To understand this statement, you must realize that until the time of Darwin, while the various Christian churches held dominance over the minds of the populace, it was generally accepted that the universe had been created exactly as written in Genesis in the biblical Old Testament. When men of science attempted to announce their discoveries and theories, they were forced to describe their new beliefs in the presence of enormous religious opposition. Consequently, they found it necessary to concentrate much of their mental energy on proving the prophet's pronouncements wrong. In doing so, their agenda caused them to lose clarity of vision, and they also became ego-driven. Thereafter, any intuitive perception proposed by the scientific fraternity was derided and rejected out of hand by other scientists. Because of this mental climate, the pendulum of the search for truth swung solely to an undeviating belief in reason and logic, thus imprisoning the human intellect in materialism for the answers to the origins of life and existence. 
Therefore, it is absolutely necessary for me to refute some of the scientific theories and show them to be as erroneous as are the so-called truths of Christian doctrine. In arriving at some of these theories, scientists and churchmen alike have dipped into the realms of unproven preposterous suppositions to answer questions which have previously been unanswerable by the earthly mind alone. Having told you that the substance of your material world is basically electrical particles agitated at high speed within space, your science is unable to tell you why such energy particles take on the density and form of matter except to speak of forces of fusion which happen to create the elements. Science cannot tell you what is the motivating force which draws particles into the form of elements. Neither can science tell you from whence such energy particles originally came except to say they were released during the time of the Big Bang, which they believe gave the first impetus to creation. Why a sudden Big Bang? Of what? What was the motivating factor behind it? Science speaks about electromagnetism, but cannot say from whence come such energies which appear and disappear. Where do they go? Why do they come back? From the human perspective, there appears to be no intelligible activity within or behind its work. Science says that electromagnetism just is a simple fact of existence, yet it produces highly purposeful and intelligent work in the form of millions of billions of substances of which your universe is made. How does this happen? There is nothing that electromagnetism has brought into visible being which the human mind can deem to be lacking purpose or meaning. Science ignores this most basic and vital level of creation. Without an answer to this question as to why everything which has been brought into visible manifestation by the activity of the twin energies of electromagnetism is invariably purposeful, successful, and rational. Nothing of any value in the search for your origins will be discovered. Until science can probe and discover the reality of the space in which electrical particles of visible being are supported, science will remain forever behind locked doors of materialism. It will be barred to eternal truth and universal wisdom and imprisoned within the bondage of reason alone reason which is solely the product of the finite activity of brain cells. It is to the true nature of the space I intend to introduce you. But before proceeding to this, I must first bring many highly pertinent questions to your attention. Down the ages, much of the work produced by electromagnetism has appeared to the mind, vision, and touch of living entities as being solid, unchangeably durable. Metals, wood, rocks, living entities were all believed to be composed of solid, inanimate, or living matter. With such a belief in a solid universe, it is only natural that the mystical prophets of old should have envisioned a mighty individual possessing enormous powers in creating all the solid substances of the universe. In visualizing such a mighty individual, it was only natural that they should perceive a kingly figure of universal control, possessing a retributive nature, when confronted with the behavior of mankind which created a turbulent society. Neither prophets of old nor science of today has been near to the truth of existence. Both have completely missed the truth. Science says that life began when, in some unexplained way, a correct combination of chemical reactions produced a molecule capable of making copies of itself by triggering further chemical reactions. Such a description of the enormous and teeming complexity and power of the life force has been discernible because it is capable of replicating itself reveals the basic impoverishment of scientific perception and thought which produce such a theory. Furthermore, the suggestion that such a combination of inanimate chemicals can get together in a specific way 
accidentally, to produce such an astounding result of self-replication remains unquestioned scientifically. This is because the finite human mind, even though scientific, cannot deal with such a strange eventuality of uninitiated self-replication. It is too suggestive of a magical occurrence of some intervention from an unimaginable source which scientific men dare not contemplate for fear of ridicule. This sheep-like acquiescence is considered more scientific than producing inspired theories blocked by the materialistic laws science has established for itself. This block to future scientific progress will prevent science properly investigating the realm of mind and spirit until some enlightened scientist defies convention and dares to cross the borderline between the seen and the unseen. Prophets of old, if presented with the theory of molecular self-replication, would have no difficulty with such a magical occurrence and would say that God made the chemical combinations and imbued them with life. That would not be the right explanation either. It is this old religious concept of a God on high, creating from afar, which is blocking the man of science from moving forward to more spiritually aware reflections. Therefore, despite science's seeming emancipation from age-old doctrines, it is still as mentally bound and hindered by fears of ancient shibboleths as in the 19th century. It adopts its ridiculous theories because it has not yet perceived the reality of our source of being behind and within the living molecule. Continuing its story of creation, science states that after the self-manufacture of living molecules capable of replicating themselves, they form themselves into a living cell, so small it cannot be seen by the naked eye, which became the building block for all the multiplexity of living organisms, including plants, insects, reptiles, birds, animals, and man himself. Therefore, all living things have a common ancestor, the first living molecule. Science cannot explain why the self-replicating molecules combine themselves into a living cell. It remains a mystery to science to this day. The living cell, your science tells you, is endlessly repeated in a billion, billion, billion differing forms. It is the building block of the visible universe. How can this be? What impulse motivates such replication? Science cannot say. Entrenched in its own blindness, it has dragged people down into materialistic blindness with it. And now the first living cell deserves the undivided attention of anyone seriously seeking the spiritual dimension and the mainspring of existence, because the first living molecule and the first living cell are the very first evidence of some intelligent activity within matter, within the universe. The foremost feature displaying sense and sensibility is the function of the membrane, which covers the cell, giving it protection and individuality. Think about this miraculous phenomenon. The cell takes in, from the environment, only selected nourishment through the membrane. Not only does the cell take in the right nutrition, but, having utilized the nutrition, the cell rids itself of the waste through the permeable membrane. You should ask yourself how the purely physical membrane of the cell, invisible to your eye, can distinguish and select the correct nourishment to enhance its well-being and then exercise sufficient discernment to rid itself of unwanted toxic matter. Do you not see a high degree of purposefulness within all this activity, and can you believe that such purposefulness is accidental? And is not purpose the very hallmark of intelligence? Not only this, the membrane of the cell continues to do this work of selection of nutrition and discarding of waste in a billion, billion different circumstances and conditions relating to survival within different species and differing environments. Is this not evidence of purposefulness displayed within every single action of every single species, be it insects, plants, reptiles, birds, animals, and human beings? 
Could you not describe the universe as being the consistent and undeviating impulse of purposefulness made visible within the realm of visible matter? Is the spirit of purposefulness a physical element or one of consciousness? And if you can accept that purposefulness is an undeniable creative impulse behind existence, then you can move on to the next perception of your universe as being the visible manifestation of an intelligent appraisal of cause and effect clearly evident within living matter. For, if the living cell can select the right nourishment and also provide for the elimination of toxic waste, this simple activity displays an awareness of the need for digestion and also foresees the resultant buildup of toxic waste and the need for the elimination of such waste to ensure the continued health of the cell. Is this not a clear indication of an intelligent appraisal of cause and effect? Furthermore, science says that the cell contains a nucleus which might be likened to the brain of a human being, since it conveys messages and its most important function is the storage of information. The library which contains not just the details relating to one cell, but of the whole body in which it resides. In fact, on investigation by science, it would appear that the cell itself is a system of chemical messages carried out in a purposeful, intelligent, and intelligible way. How could this happen if the origins of the cell's molecules were only inanimate chemical elements? Would you dispute that behind every messenger with a message to convey, there is an intelligent thought or consciousness? And behold how accurate are the messages transferred from cell to cell to ensure the accurate replication of certain species for millions of years. At what point in creation then did consciousness creep into living organisms, come into the field of unconscious inanimate matter? Without inherent consciousness, how can so much informed and informing activity take place in a cell invisible to the living eye? Is not such activity the product of consciousness, awareness, proving the presence of intelligent life in the lowest common denominator? Furthermore, a single living cell in the form of a bacterium can move about on its own and live its own specialized, frequently exciting life within the environment, or as a virus doing its deadly specialized work of attacking specific targets within living organisms. Alternatively, the cell may be fixed within an organism, carrying out its own highly important work of construction and maintenance of some part of the organism. Such work produces living material exactly suited and necessary to the living organ on which it works be it parts of the human body or of animal life or plant, such as the human toes and spleen or animal fur and tusks or fish scales and feathers of birds or bark of tree and foliage on branches or petals and stalk of flowers or antennae of butterflies and their gauzy wings, the reptilian skin of crocodiles and their teeth, the eyes of squid and their skins, which change color according to the need of camouflage. Each of these completely diverse and seemingly unrelated physical phenomena are created by the individual specialized work of billions and billions and billions of identical living cells. On contemplating the magnitude and diversity of the work accomplished by a simple living cell invisible to the naked eye, can you believe in a mechanistic universe? It would be possible to do so if matter produced by such cells was illogical, offering no plausible purpose behind or the reason for its existence, devoid of personal consciousness. But this is not so. These identical living cells work together in harmony within man or beast to make a liver with its multiple duties within the body, to create an intricate eye having its own special purposes of putting the entity into direct and intelligent touch with its environment, incorporating the assistance of the brain or strong bones expressly and intricately designed in conjunction with tendons and muscles 
to unite with others in such convenient ways as to enable full and supple movement of the entity. Furthermore, the cells never intrude on each other's work. When creating a kidney, they do not suddenly make an ear. When creating hair, they do not suddenly launch into making skin. No, cells create the scalp, and the self-same cells create the hair. The only difference between skin and hair cells is the work they do, second by second, through a lifetime. Why? What is the motivating and inspiring factor? Accident? What organizing intelligence set the entire process of creation in motion from the most fundamental level of the formation of simple elements out of the free electrical particles within space, the combining of elements to form chemicals, the correct combination of specific chemicals to form a living molecule, the correct combination of living molecules to make a living cell, which can take in nutrition, excrete waste, build according to clear-cut specification, move about, and sustain this enormous edifice of creation consistently through billions of years. Not only this, but what is the motivating force which has designed and successfully evolved within living systems and entities billions and billions of different ways in which to fertilize seeds of every kind, whether they be those of plants, insects, reptiles, birds, animals, or human beings, evolving for each an intelligent system of procreation suited to climactic conditions, the production of vegetation in the environment, in order to ensure survival. Is not survival also evidence of intelligent, purposeful activity? And having accomplished this great feat of creativity, should you not question how it is that every living species has its own individualistic way of rearing its young and protecting it as far as possible until the young are capable of survival on their own? Is this not love for creation active in its highest form? You cannot move on from this analysis of what the human intelligence has to say about the origins of life and creativity without mentioning the all-important molecule DNA, which are said to carry the plan for the whole organism, plant or baby. Furthermore, these DNA molecules give the instructions to the cells, informing them that they should build according to the chromosomes deposited by the seed. Yes, indeed, in place of intelligence, science has given you the DNA molecules as your source of existence, your supreme leader, your director of creation upon which materialistic, flimsy cells, the whole of creation must depend for its survival. Behold the glorious DNA, Lord of your creation. From whence did the DNA cells draw their intelligent directional powers? Science is quite satisfied now that it has been able to satisfactorily explain why the various species of every kind replicate themselves so accurately and consistently. Science would have you believe that you live in a purely mechanistic universe, that the phenomenon of evolution arises out of chance mutations and the survival of the fittest. If you study the various organisms of creation, the multifold and differing activities of related species, can you truly believe in such an unlikely materialistic concept? It has been no mere coincidence that today, to enable you to discover the vast intelligence behind creation, you have numerous creative people who embark on difficult journeys to explore, determine, and photograph the habitats and habits of wild creatures and plants. You are entertained and instructed by a feast of facts and photographs of the wonders of your universe. In my time on earth, I had no such marvels to refer to in order to teach the Jews the universal truth of existence. I only had domestic animals and birds to use as examples of the marvelous inventiveness and intelligence and awareness apparent in every living thing. Nowhere has it been written in the Gospels that I referred to a high and mighty Jehovah as Creator, as was customary with the Jewish leaders. No, I turned to the countryside, the flowers and birds, and tried to show my fellow countrymen that they were surrounded by a marvelous and miraculous creation. 
2,000 years ago in your dimension, we lacked your modern scientific background to be able to intelligently observe and explain the activity of what I termed the Father everywhere around them. To discover your true source of being, I ask you to take stock of the unimaginable and indescribable complexity and diversity of purposeful work plainly evident in penguins and pigs. Can the human mind replicate any of the most basic of activities within, say, the digestive system, which swiftly summons up the requisite enzymes and hormones necessary for digestion? How dare the finite mind, which is incapable of perceiving clearly the true creative process governed by instinctual knowledge, presume to state unequivocally, defying contradiction, that it understands the true origins of creation and the forces out of which creation took form. What arrogance! These men can only think according to what their eyes tell them. I view the present scientific ignorance with loving compassion, a degree of amusement, and a great all-consuming passion to puncture their pride. For, until someone can penetrate their self-satisfaction and position of infallibility, a true mating of eternal verities and human scientific knowledge can never take place. But it must take place, otherwise human spiritual evolution will remain at a standstill. The scientific mind is too full of finitely devised book lore, accepted formulas and equations, and the need for their fellows' approval to permit mystical penetration by higher intelligences. On my behalf, I ask readers of these letters to form an association to challenge science and ask, at what point in the evolution of the material world is consciousness first discernible? I repeat, and mean what I say, ask the scientist at what point in the evolution of the world is consciousness first discernible? In the living cell? If in the living cell, ask whether it was discernible in the living molecules which combined to make a cell and encase itself in such an intelligently designed membrane, permitting the intake of selected food and excretion of toxic waste. How does it recognize toxic waste? And if it should be conceded that consciousness might be present and having reached such a possibility, should you not go further and ask from whence comes electromagnetism? What is the reality of electricity more than streaks of fierce light now described by science as photons and electrons? And what is the reality of magnetism more than twofold energies of bonding and rejection, energy impulses which have brought stability and order into chaos? As science, from whence comes electromagnetism, which is responsible for the most basic steps in the creation of an ordered and orderly universe, of an unimaginable complexity and diversity. I will now attempt to put into your words that which is beyond all words and presently beyond all individualized earthly comprehension. Therefore, the intellect, although it assists the brain to understand intellectually the spiritual realities I am putting before you, it also creates a barrier to true spiritual perception and experience. For this reason, regard the following references to the ultimate universal dimension as only guidelines, ideas, shadow consciousness forms of the reality behind and within your university. Take each idea, one by one, into meditation. What I am about to explain is entirely within and of consciousness without parameters and boundaries. If you are sufficiently spiritually evolved to follow me there, Beyond the words, you will begin to understand spiritually all I am trying to tell you. The words will guide you towards and then unlock new vistas of being for you. Persevere. The light will gradually, perhaps imperceptibly, penetrate your mind and you will have little bursts of insight. There are many who have experienced a little burst of insight, have briefly felt a touch of divine consciousness, and then hardly daring to continue to believe in such a transcendent moment of awareness, have begun to question, doubt, and finally dispel the little inflow of divine consciousness. Beware you do not do this. Disbelief will set you back and mesh you in the material plane of existence more than you will ever know. 
Whatever you are given and able to receive, hold fast to it and do not doubt. Doubt destroys steady progress because it creates its own consciousness forms, which will suppress and even eradicate the insight you had gained previously. Therefore, your choice of thoughts, belief or disbelief, doubt or faith, construct or destroy your progress in your search for truth. Any denial erases from your consciousness the progress which has been previously made. Furthermore, the higher you ascend in spiritual truth, the more powerful do your thoughts become. Therefore, create and hold fast to your own spiritual momentum and allow no one to intrude and undermine that momentum. Hold firm to your former perceptions. In times of doubt, cruise along in positive thoughts using enlightening affirmations, clinging to earlier inspirational guidance when your consciousness frequencies of vibration were higher. By use of your willpower, choosing affirmations containing golden nuggets of spiritual truth, return to this higher level of consciousness again and again. Do not, through mental laziness, wholly surrender to the ebb and flow of spiritual consciousness energies and become a spiritual seesaw. I cannot emphasize this danger of self-obstruction strongly enough. Become actively aware of it. If you know anything of the accounts of my life in Palestine, you will recall that I too suffered the phenomenon of ebb and flow of spiritual consciousness and found it necessary to absent myself in the hills to pray and meditate and renew my spiritual strength. Therefore, Understand your dry periods, but do not give way to them by yielding passively to an undesirable change in your attitudes and mental emotional patterns. As you conscientiously draw upon your source of being for new strength and the upliftment of your consciousness frequencies, so will these negative periods be greatly reduced in strength and duration. I repeat, at all times beware how you use your minds. Let your mental activity always be constructive that it may contribute to your own spiritual growth rather than its constant hindrance. Having said all of the above and proceeded to dictate the rest of the letter, the recorder of my words began to question the likely public reception of this letter because it seemed to her too pragmatic to appeal to people who are accustomed to picturing some magnificent power or being or utterly other which gave birth to the universe. Indeed, I have made numerous efforts to describe the immensity of the power out of which all things have come, but as I have said, it is impossible for me to describe in human terms the reality of the source of your being. Those spiritually evolved souls who have been lightly infused with divine consciousness report the experience to be utterly beautiful and glorious and entirely unforgettable, but still not fully describable in human terms. This mystical experience is possible when the frequencies of the vibration of the mind are already raised and the entire consciousness is suffused with rays of divine consciousness. It is a condition that involves the feelings more than the intellect and brain cells. In this case, where I have to infuse my recorder's mind and brain cells with a description of the reality of your source of being, and she has to interpret in words, I have to take care not to interfere too forcefully with the frequencies of vibrations of consciousness in which my recorder's brain cells are working. There have been occasions when it was dangerous to proceed any further, and I have interrupted the working of her computer to break the contact. Before you begin to study, meditate, and absorb the following pages, I want to make it clear to all who read these letters that my purpose in coming through them is first and foremost to dispel the myths which have surrounded my human persona and teachings. It is my intention that religious dogma and doctrine should eventually die a natural death worldwide, as complete a death as the animal sacrifices in the Temple of Solomon. Secondly, I have also come to help the churches let go their archaic notions of God and sin, no true spiritual progress is possible until the dawning of a clear realization that each person is responsible for the way his or her life develops. Thirdly, I have come to remove from your minds the pictures of an almighty God of magnificence and grandeur and unlimited active power, who rewards the virtuous and punishes the wicked. These beliefs are wholly erroneous, 
albeit comforting. Fourthly, I am explaining the truth of being for you to finally dispel the old concept of God sitting aloft somewhere in heaven, where he is said to have created the world and all that is in it, in a relatively short while. Fifthly, I have come expressly to help science bridge the gulf between universal consciousness and the appearance of electrical particles. Without this bridge between the unseen spiritual dimension and the seen world of matter, science will remain rooted in old ideas and concepts instead of moving forward into new realms of spiritual, scientific research for the betterment of mankind. I have also come to show you the true nature of that which brought you into being, gave you individuality. For without this knowledge, which will reveal to you the nature of your dual yet fully interrelated being, spirit and body, you will also remain rooted in the same level of consciousness as you are at this moment. I want to make it manifestly clear that nothing ever comes from nothing. This is a well-known saying amongst you and a perfectly true one. However, there is an eternal, infinite, consistent foundation of beingness, and this I am going to reveal to you. You have not been created. You have drawn your being from it. Obviously, you could not have come from something entirely foreign to your own consciousness. I am asking my recorder to choose some mundane, understandable examples. You could not draw a filling for tarts from a vat of treacle and discover they were mincemeat. You could not squeeze an orange and make ginger beer from the juice. You could not fill a balloon with air, pop it, and find it was dripping jelly. All of the above examples chosen by my recorder are instances of logic. I want you to realize that your entire universe is a manifestation of logic and consistent logical effects arising out of related causation. Your universe is cause and effect made visible. This is an undeviating principle of existence. If there are instances of deviation such as paranormal experiences or instantaneous healings, the average person exclaims in astonishment and science refuses to believe that such a thing is possible. As my explanation deepens, you will eventually understand how such deviations take place logically and effectually. In other words, these deviations occur according to natural spiritual laws and always serve a necessary purpose. Nowhere is there any mindlessness in creation, even in the ant or gnat, unless the mind of an entity has been born defective or been damaged. Therefore it is clear you live and operate in a physical universe which displays the highest degree of intelligence and purposeful activity within the creation of matter itself, in the physical bodies of all individual entities from plants to human beings. Unfortunately, this high degree of intelligence and purposeful caring is only minimal in the consciousness displayed by the created entities themselves from plants to human beings. In other words, the bodies in which you conduct your lives, in which you think and feel and do whatever comes to mind, manifest within their physical organs and working parts a very much higher order of intelligence and loving purpose than does your human consciousness. Human interests are mostly wrapped up in the problems of daily survival, enjoyment of pleasures, and emotional, physical satisfaction. To achieve these purposes, the majority of people use only the commodities manufactured out of matter. Even the minds of scientists cannot fully unravel the hidden secrets of earthly existence, and despite all their scientific expertise, are as bogged down in the changing fortunes of existence as are those who have no learning at all. Therefore, it is a logical conclusion that that out of which you have drawn your physical being is one of immensity not only of size, but immensity of willpower, the will to self-expression and creativity. Visualize for a moment the size of the material universe, the sun and its heat, the moon, the earth planet and solar system, the galaxies of stars, and the fact that all of this visible material is totally interdependent, yet also dependent 
on the movement of the planetary bodies and subject to universal laws of consistent function and movement. This vast universe has had its origins within and has been drawn out of the foundation of your being, and the entirety of life force energy in the universe has been drawn out of the same foundation of being. Therefore, do not be dismayed if in my efforts to analyze for you the spiritual components of your source of being, you find that you recognize what these components are, and to a very, very, very limited extent, possess the same spiritual components of consciousness yourself. You have drawn all that you are, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, from your source of being. Before I explain to you how this could be, I want you to take certain steps to help your minds absorb the immensity of that out of which you have drawn your being. After you have read the next pages to the end of my letter, take each paragraph individually into meditation and visualization, for only in this way will the words begin to grow in realization and take on the spiritual reality of their true meaning. All spiritual, unseen, seen, imagined, is consciousness awareness. The primary comprehensive nature of consciousness is awareness. It is not possible to have consciousness without possessing awareness. All that you see, all that you touch, hear, feel, know, is consciousness awareness made visible. There is nothing in the universe that is not consciousness made visible. Consciousness, awareness, is infinite and eternal. There are two dimensions of consciousness, both beyond and within your own earthly plane of existence. The plane of heavy matter, solid form. The ultimate universal dimension of consciousness awareness can never be fully or truly known by an individualized spirit. It is inaccessible. It is in equilibrium. It is the only source of all power, wisdom, love, intelligence. The universal dimension of consciousness, awareness, and equilibrium is a state of silence and stillness out of which come sound, color, individualized form, and all visible creativity within the visible universe. Out of ultimate universal dimension of consciousness, awareness, and equilibrium has come all of creation all the various unseen dimensions of existence, descending in order of spirituality from the very portals of the universal dimension down to the most ponderous vibrational frequencies of inanimate earthly substances and beyond into unspeakable horrors of consciousness perversions and anti-truth. This ultimate universal dimension of consciousness awareness is not only in space, it is all space. It is undetectably everywhere. For those who think in terms of atoms, you can say it is the space in the atom. Therefore, it is in silence and equilibrium within the space of all elements and matter. The nature of universal consciousness is intent, inactive, and in equilibrium. Therefore, universal consciousness is an infinite, eternal, limitless, boundless state of powerful intent pristine, pure, beautiful. This intent is to express its nature. Universal consciousness, nature, intent is the allness of will and purpose always locked in embrace. The universal will is to move out and create. The universal purpose is to give individual form to creation and experience it. Within the ultimate universal dimension of consciousness, awareness, intent, universal will is in a state of mutual restraint with universal purpose, both in perfect equilibrium within silence and stillness. Universal will is universal intelligence, universal purpose is universal love, universally in equilibrium, in mutual restraint, out of which all things visible and invisible and human impulses have taken form. If you could receive the fullness of universal reality into yourself, you would be disintegrated by its explosive power and dissolved into formless consciousness awareness. It as far transcends the individual humanhood as the heat and light of your sun is billion times more powerful 
than the light of your fireflies flickering in darkness. When I was on earth, I made a distinction between your Father in heaven and your Father within you. When I spoke of your Father in heaven, I meant universal intelligence. Because of the Jewish attitude to women, I only referred to this aspect of universal consciousness. Now to you who are so aware of the equality of genders, I speak of father-mother consciousness in equilibrium within universal consciousness awareness, where father consciousness is universal intelligence, mother consciousness is universal love. The tool of father consciousness creative energy, electricity, is in a state of mutual restraint equilibrium with the tools of mother consciousness creative energy magnetism. Because father-mother tools, electromagnetism, is in equilibrium within the universal consciousness, it will never be detected within space by scientists, no matter how they may probe space. The impulse, father consciousness will, is intelligent activity, in equilibrium with the impulse, mother consciousness, purpose, is nurturing for survival, Father-mother consciousness is a powerful impersonal force, yet it is personal for you even before you seek to make contact with it. As you evolve spiritually, you will feel it, for it is the reality of being. It is everywhere and within everything. Father consciousness is the intelligent love which gives intelligent energy and momentum to the world of complex forms, expressed physically as electricity. Mother purpose is the loving intelligence which gives purpose and the impulse for survival to the individualized complex forms expressed as magnetism, bonding, and repulsion. These are the universal primal impulses of all being of universal consciousness, your source of being, intelligence, love. This is the state of being before creation. This is the state of being before creation. Consciousness Awareness within a state of equilibrium. I want you to move again into an inner state of conscious equilibrium, where all thought is stilled and your mind resides in silence. You are in interior control, your mind and emotions no longer divided into activity and feeling. You may feel a build-up of power within you, strength, peace, and contentment, this, expressed in you in individual form, is the state of being out of which came creation. I want you to notice that the equilibrium is impossible the moment that thought is introduced. I want you to realize that the universal dimension is a dimension of unformed impulses. It contains no blueprint of creation. It is in a state of undivided form. The equilibrium, the restraint between opposing impulses to move about and remain bonded, creates an infinite spiral of self-contained energy. The self-contained energy of mutual restraint is beyond the power of individuality to even imagine. As I have told you before, were individuality able to enter the universal dimension of the mutually restrained impulses of movement and bonding, the individuality would be immediately dissolved and returned to the equilibrium of universal consciousness. Ponder the unimaginable immensity of power contained within the mutual restraint of the two impulses in universal consciousness, which are primarily consciousness slash awareness, intent, will, purpose, Intelligence love combined as intelligent love and loving intelligence. Impulses of movement, bonding hyphen, repulsion. Electricity, in equilibrium, magnetism. The above describes the unlimited universal dimension before the Big Bang. You now know that the father-mother creative process and the tools of physical creation are all in a state of equilibrium within the universal dimension. But now that equilibrium is to be exploded to bring about individual form. 
You know, too, that since the infinite eternal impulses are contained in a state of mutual restraint, these impulses are of an unimaginable intensity of energy, against which your atomic energy contained within the splitting of an atom is a mere poof, an infinitesimal twitch of no importance. I want you to realize all the foregoing, since your realization of what happened at the time of the Big Bang will give you a glimpse of what happened at the time of the sundering of universal consciousness to permit the creation of individual form to take place. Universal consciousness was riven. Will and purpose, father intelligence and mother nurturing love were exploded to work independently and also jointly. Their respective tools were electricity and magnetism. Out of the great explosion of equilibrium came the great intent of self-expression. The universal awareness of being became the impulse of individualized I, awareness demanding self-expression. Life and I-ness are synonymous in the dimension of matter. They became consciousness of matter. What is the consciousness of life? It is. Father Intelligence and Mother Love Impulse of Movement Impulse of Purpose Nurturing Survival Seen as Electricity Seen as Magnetism In Matter Can you begin to imagine the explosion of consciousness, of awareness? To help you fractionally visualize what happened at the moment of the Big Bang, try to recall a moment when you also experienced an explosion in your consciousness. This takes place when you have set your entire being on achieving some very important goal, about to embark on your plans in a state of excited anticipation, some trivial circumstance or insensitive person prevents you from achieving your heartfelt purposes. How would you feel? Your concentration would be split and you would explode. Here again, I must call on my recorder to think up some examples of my meaning in human terms, for the least earthly consciousness is drawn from universal consciousness. You are at the airport, excited and ready to fly for an unexpected holiday overseas. On reaching your travel bureau counter, you discover there are no documents or tickets, and no record of any reservations for flight or holiday accommodation, although you have already paid for them by credit card. How would you feel? You are dressed in a very expensive outfit, whining and dining important customers, and are about to clinch a big contract worth millions. The waiter drops a plate of hot casserole on your head. How will you feel? You go shopping and come out to the car park to find the wheels and doors of your car have been removed in broad daylight. Sympathetically, You open your purse to give a whining crippled beggar all your silver, but the man straightens up, forcefully snatches the purse from you, and runs like an athlete. How will you feel? In all these instances, you would have a strong consciousness enterprise to the very front of your mind. Your head would be filled with a plan to move out and to do something to achieve a certain purpose peacefully. Your intent would be interlocked with your purpose. Therefore, in equilibrium. But note, there would be a mounting tension of anticipation as you neared your goal. The greater the tension, the greater the explosion. You would, in fact, be in the same state as universal consciousness slash awareness intent, father intelligence in equilibrium with the mother purpose to give being and form to the plan you intend to create. After your explosion, can you imagine the ensuing mental slash emotional chaos, the inability to think straight, the thoughts which would come, one after another, demanding expression, none of them sensible or logical? Try to realize that you, individualized form, are the microcosm of the macrocosm. You are a pinhead expressing universal consciousness slash awareness, either in equilibrium when you meditate in stillness of thought, or as active consciousness when you think and feel, plan and create. Therefore, 
if you can relate your tiny consciousness explosion to the explosion of the heavens, you will gain some small idea of the ensuing chaos, both momentarily within the universal dimension and in eons of time within the newly created expanse of the dimension of matter still in its formless state. Therefore, many of you will have to wholly rearrange your thinking in regard to creation. It started out as a condition of utter chaos. The universal impulses were divided. There were no blueprints to direct or control the beginning of individuality. The impulses were still without any conscious form or direction. They were natural impulses to perform certain distinct impulsive functions in consciousness, but they were not intelligently directed into specific movement or bonding by any higher directing force. They were on their own. Separated and lost impulses of consciousness slash awareness, able to receive impressions, but there were no impressions to receive other than those of interior chaos, of movement, hyphen activity of electricity and bonding hyphen repulsion of magnetism. And this consciousness chaos was manifested within creation as chaos of particles. Within this expanse of chaos of electrical particles, however, there was an overriding awareness of I-ness. No matter what the chaos, the I-ness came through in the Father intent to move about to take control, to create. The Inus took initial form in a positive charge of electrical energy. It became the dominant I force as a proton with its satellite of negative electrical charge, whereupon mother purpose of bonding was activated in those conditions of a positive electrical charge meeting a negative electrical charge. They took to each other, as one might say of the evolved male and female in living species, and bonded. Mother purpose of repulsion was also activated when two positive or two negative electrical charges looked likely to meet and react negatively. She stepped in and pushed them apart, just like her evolved female mother counterpart would separate two unruly, highly charged ruffians about to engage in a fight. This was the only form of consciousness awareness within the chaos for a very long time, since time is of no consequence within the realm of matter itself. Time only becomes of importance when there occurs an impinging of consciousness awareness between electrical impulses resulting in bonding or repulsion, a progression of adjacencies and events taking place and purposes to be fulfilled. Otherwise, time is meaningless. Creation is the product of primary impulses working individually and together, making impressions upon the other, fulfilling inbuilt needs imprinted within consciousness, these needs being at the outset to increase and experience self-expression, leading to further separation and then to restore a sense of inner security and comfort to be reunited within the harmony of universal consciousness. Out of this driving force for a reunited harmony of being came the male-female drive for reunion to recapture the bliss which is buried in the soul consciousness. You could make an analogy of the foregoing paragraph with the habit of fathers going out to work in the morning and returning, hopefully, to the comfort and reunion with family in the evening where he regains the strength to venture forth the next morning to do battle with the world. Therefore, the process of creation of universal self-expression took billions of years within time to accomplish. After the Big Bang, the father-mother creative process was divided into two different energies, continually working apart and together, independent yet mutually constrained to work together, having individual characteristics or natures and different functions. Therefore, their workload was and is different yet indivisible. You already know and by a process of meditation should have fully understood the nature of the father and the nature of the mother within the equilibrium of the universal dimension. Briefly, the nature of the father is to be active, creative, 
and perform the work of creativity. It is also the eyeness of individualized existence. Everything living from a hornet to a hippopotamus has a strong sense of eyeness and the need to protect that eyeness. The nature of the mother is to give form to the electrical consciousness plan initiated by Father Intelligence by bonding the electrical particles together. Father and mother consciousness, primary impulses, are both within the equilibrium and of the nature of the universal dimension, and consequently as they create individual form, they carry out the work of the nature of the universal dimension, which is growth, providing nutrition, nourishment, healing, protection, fulfillment of need within a consistent system of law and order, survival. Father and mother consciousness energies are impulses both restrained within the universal dimension and when they have been released from equilibrium, they powerfully perform the work of creation. Furthermore, consider the magnitude of their work within creation throughout the world. The father-mother impulses prompt every level of creation from the formation of elements, the living molecule and cell, to the magnificent mammoth. They also work instinctually within parents to prompt them to unify, to conceive, bear, and rear their young. Some fathers absent themselves after the birth of their progeny, be they eggs, puppies, or humans. These are fathers whose sense of eyeness is greater than their inborn fathering instincts. It is at this point that you must become fully aware of the meaning of impulse. You may think that this seems a very nebulous form of creativity, but if you reflect for a while, you may eventually realize that no human or animal or insect or even plant undertakes any activity within the material dimension without an inner consciousness coercion, which is an impulse. It may be to turn to face the sun, to run, to eat, to work, to sleep, to go shopping, to have a baby. Always, the impulse precedes the activity, even the flick of an eyelid. Furthermore, there is no impulse prompting any activity which is not directed by a purpose. Plants turn flowers and leaves to catch the rays of the sun for growth. People run to get fit, eat to satisfy hunger, work to earn a salary, sleep to escape the tensions and recharge the energy go shopping to buy food, all directed at survival and personal comfort. Therefore, the impulses are the reality behind and within all creation. If all matter were to return to its original form of electrical particles, the universal impulses would remain intact and would eventually give form to another creation. The impulses are forever. However, electrical particles within living matter are here today and gone tomorrow, but the soul moves on. You think with electrical impulses in the brain. You feel with magnetic impulses in your nervous system. They center and bond the electrical impulses into a cohesive whole. Without the magnetic bonding in your system, you would be all go-go and no, no, no. Now is the moment to take you back to my desert experiences described to you in letter one. You may remember that when I went to the River Jordan to be baptized by John, I was a rebel, my face set against the teachings of the Jews, who stated that Jehovah punished men for their sins. Intuitively, I felt that this was a false and cruel concept and rejected it. After I was shown the truth concerning creation, I could not understand why perfect consciousness did not create perfect beings made in the image of their creator intelligent love. I asked the creator, universal consciousness, why mankind endured so much suffering and evil. I was then shown very clearly that all the problems experienced by humans arose from the central point of the self. Science now calls this the ego. It manifested itself in the personality as a driving need to defend the self from criticism and or emotional or physical attack, and a similar driving need to push aside other people 
in order to arrive first in the race of life. It also manifested itself in the personality as a driving need to take all that was best for the self despite the opposition of others and a similar driving need to hold on to personal possessions, be they relatives, friends, material goods, or achievements, despite any opposition. I was also made to understand that without these two fundamental, eternal, undeviating impulses of creative being, there would be no creation. This is the secret of creation, and the secret of existence, and of the individual being. By working together as a team, separately, but inseparable, in the visible world, these twin impulses were the means by which the substances of matter itself has been created out of the sublime universal consciousness. One impulse of creativity is the I-ness of activity. This impulse of activity is universal and stems from only one source. Activity is a movement in consciousness and consciousness in movement. The other creative impulse possesses, figuratively speaking, two faces looking in opposite directions. They are bonding, rejection, pull towards the self, push away from the self, otherwise known as attraction, repulsion, attract to the self, repel from the self, within consciousness. These are the only means by which earthly existence has been achieved. The entire universe is a manifestation of the creative power active within these twin impulses of physical being, creating matter and individual form. This is one of the fundamental secrets of the universe. I saw that the core of the personality, or ego as it is now called, had been created guardian of personality and was irresistibly imprinted with the magnetic impulse to ensure privacy and survival for the protection of the individual Inus. This was accomplished by using the two faces of the second impulse of being, bonding, rejection, to secure individuality. The face of bonding drags, draws, attracts, demands, pulls, buys, grabs, clutches, clings to the people and possessions it craves. This impulse creates an illusion of security in togetherness and possessions. It is the tool of mother consciousness inspiring the building of families, communities, and nations. It can be productive of beauty, joy, harmony, and love. It can also wreck lives and destroy communities when it is ego-driven. The face of rejection repels, thrusts aside, pushes away, evades everything, people, animals, possessions it does not want. This impulse of rejection creates an illusion of privacy and security. It is the impulse that urges rifts in families, relationships, communities, and nations. It is supposedly geared to saving lives, ensuring protection and privacy, but it is a destructive force when it is ego-driven. Without these two impulses of being, all things would have remained forever merged into one another within the eternal timelessness of universal creative power in equilibrium. Without these twin impulses, there would be no interplay of give and take and push and pull necessary to the creation of the millions of personal experiences out of which personality grows and evolves. Therefore, the problem of personality and the ego drive endured by all living things and mankind was and is an irrevocable, unavoidable fact of creation. Any other explanation is pure myth. I saw that what men called sin was the direct result of the interplay of the bonding-rejection impulses within human nature. This bonding-rejection impulses constituted the emotional, mental mask worn by all created individual entities, including birds and animals. You see these impulses at work within all of nature, even within plant life. The bonding rejection impulses directed and directs the behavior towards survival in all entities in creation. There was no escaping the bonding rejection impulses.
These twin impulses were the ephemeral source of all worldly comfort, pleasure, happiness, and also the source of all sickness, misery, and deprivation in the world. However, added to these, transcending, underlying, and interpenetrating all, was and is the life born of the explosion of universal consciousness is the very foundation and source of earthly consciousness. Therefore, even as the father-mother consciousness is creative, so is man's thinking creative. For human thought and feeling are both the exercise and the union of the twin souls of father-mother consciousness. Therefore, these impulses of bonding rejection in the individual personality also become highly creative in that they determine and make visible the consciousness forms of things desired and things rejected. This is the second fundamental secret of the universe. I saw that sin was an artificial concept expediently devised by men to describe any human activity causing pain to others. Because of their natural makeup of grabbing from other people and of rudely repelling them, in order to get what they wanted from life, it was inevitable that all human beings would, at some time, cause other human beings some form of distress or suffering. This human propensity to hurt others in no way caused offense to universal consciousness, God, as was affirmed by the Jewish and Christian religion. Only mankind understood the meaning of the word sin, since only mankind and all of creation subject to mankind, would ever know the pain, deprivation, and misery caused by the two fundamental impulses of individuality, bonding rejection, active within the human personality. Man's inbuilt impulse to protect his own individuality had made him set up rules and laws for human society. The universal creative power, love, had absolutely nothing to do with the setting up of human restrictions limitations, laws, and judgment. I also saw that the father-mother creative power, life, continually flowed through all the universe and was the life in my mind using the twin impulses of thought and feeling. Hence, any powerful, imperfect thinking and feeling could disturb and change the consciousness pattern of created things. Conversely, my thinking, when fully cleansed of the two impulses of ego and fully receptive of the father-mother creative power, intelligence, love, would reintroduce the condition of perfect intelligent love. Therefore, a condition previously made imperfect as a result of imperfect thought could be brought back into a condition of wholeness again by changing ego attitudes and thoughts to those of unconditional love. My mind was a tool of the whole creative process originating in the universal. Now that I knew this was so, knew it spiritually, intellectually, emotionally, I realized I could and must take steps to overcome the twin impulses of ego previously governing my mind in order to allow the divine reality full scope through my mind and brain. This is why there was a struggle between my humanly entrenched ego and my father-mother consciousness during the very strident temptations I experienced at the end of my enlightenment in the desert. Satan had nothing to do with the tug of war which took place within my consciousness. The war was waged between the twin impulses of individuality, bonding, rejection, and the divine reality which had made itself known to me as intelligent love life, transcendent yet within me, and which would gradually take over my individuality to an ever greater extent if I continually meditated and cleared my consciousness of selfish impulses. The foregoing is a description of the powerful knowledge I returned to Nazareth with. Therefore, my physical healing time spent with my mother while she nursed me back to health was also a time of prayer and meditation from which I drew the inspiration and strength to consciously and conscientiously live the nature of the divine or universal reality. 
As you know, the nature of the divine or universal reality is life. When it is active within creation, or, or we can also say, within the individuality of creation, it grows, nourishes, provides nutrition, regenerates, heals, protects, ensures survival, fulfills the needs of everything created, all within a system of perfect harmony, cooperation, and law and order. This is the nature of life. All its work in creation is done in accordance with universal nature, the promotion of the highest good of all living things. If you can understand these words, you will realize why I returned from the desert, a man filled with joy, with a new awareness of the beauty of the world, a feeling of absolute confidence and knowing it was possible to control the appearance of matter. You will feel with me my own elation that I could now offer the Jews the glorious news that the kingdom of heaven was in their midst. All they had to do was find it with my assistance and their lives would be changed forever. I leave you with the same knowledge which, prayerfully used and fully understood, can change the course of your life. As you read, your consciousness will be lifted and as you seek inspiration, it will come to you. I long for you to understand, aspire, grow, and achieve. Relax in my light, for while you read, reflect, meditate, and pray, you are drawn into my Christ consciousness, which will become ever more apparent to you as you evolve within this divine knowledge. My love and faith in your growing wisdom enfold you.